Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 16th Botsock webinar. And um, we're very pleased that you've made the time to join us this evening. My name is Rupert Koopman. I'm the Conservation Manager at the Botanical Society of South Africa. And uh, our um, role in civil society is to know, grow, protect, and enjoy South Africa's plants. Um, and one of those uh, aspects of enjoyment is knowing about our plants. And uh, tonight, um, especially past uh, the fact that we've just had a, a couple of really good um, workshops on pollination. So tonight's um, theme of the webinar is pollination again. And um, we're going to delve really deep into flowers, why flowers and what they do. And um, I also just want to share a screen quickly myself. Um, so there we go. And um, before we delve into the wonderful world of pollination, like this beetle, um, I just wanted to give a quick update from the recently concluded City Nature Challenge. And before we go there, I think this cartoon really well uh, sums up what we're trying to achieve with the uh, City Nature Challenge is the fact that we don't think that nature's over there, but nature is all around us and close by. So I used to think I lived in an ugly place that I'd have to go far to find beauty, but I've learned it's not about looking further, but closer. And uh, we hope that all of you are looking closer. So, oh, before that, from a housekeeping point of view, um, if uh, you could please introduce yourself in the chat and say where you're from, um, whether you're a Botsock member or not, uh, and then if you have questions for the uh, panelists, please put that in the Q&A area and then we'll be able to monitor it better. Right, so CNC, it's really was a good one and I'm not going to delve much more into the details than this because you could spend literally hours picking out the different details here. So you can see, um, Southern Africa, so we're part of SADC, and they've been, there were observations from all over, 137,000 observations, 8,600 species, and um, interestingly, 2,700 observers. And why I say interestingly, because, because oops, ah, lost the slide, but if, if you compare to 2021, um, let me just try and find that. Uh, okay, but we've got 500 more observers than than last time around, and also more than 10,000 more observations. So we're growing, and also the map is growing, and that's wonderful. Uh, for purposes of tracking what you're up to, if you're a Botsock member, please go onto iNaturalist and you're active there, and join the Botanical Society um, project. And we also want to remind people that um, just because the City Nature Challenge is over doesn't mean that you have to stop observing and stop identifying the unidentified uh, observations out there. Uh, there's a, a Dr. Allen um, who's, put, who's identified more than a million um, observations on iNaturalist. So uh, I'm sure you guys can do that too. And um, then I just want to do, um, okay, that's, that's for later. Right, so please go and join the iNatural project. Um, join the Q&As, questions in the Q&As. And I'm going to share our first, uh, or, or ask our first speaker, uh, Prof. Bruce Anderson, to um, put his camera on and start sharing his screen. Bruce Anderson is uh, a, he wanted to be, to be an entomologist from age four, according to his bio, <laughs> and is just fascinated by um, natural processes and um, really an outdoor person. But uh, I've, I've known him as the pollination guy for almost two decades now. And um, first at UCT and now at Stellenbosch, 
and we're really keen because Bruce has got quite a, um, what shall we say, existential thing. It's basically his title is seed production and pollen wars, but it'll answer the question to you, why flowers? So thanks, Bruce. Uh, take it away and we look forward to the talk. Thanks so much, Rupert. Um, I'd like to thank you actually for inviting me to the to talk today. And um, I'm actually really honored to be paired up also with two young hip and happening uh, botanists, um, Ethan and Jessica. So um, I'm going to start, but I think uh, um, I think we're going to have a lot of fun today. Um, today, I'd like to talk about the mechanics of why flowers are beautiful. And the short answer to that is that their beauty enhances their ability to both receive, but also to export pollen. And in today's other talks, I think you'll see maybe how floral morphology interacts with the morphology and also the behavior of pollinators to facilitate um, pollen pickup and pollen deposition. Um, but I'll be talking a little bit about the nitty gritty of how natural selection operates and acts on flowers. And I'll introduce two pathways through which selection acts, seed production and what I've been calling pollen wars. So from an evolutionary point of view, pollen movement is important because it potentially impacts the fitness of plants. And we all know that fitness is the currency of natural selection. And it's something that we can actually quantify. Fitness is not necessarily how long you live or how fast you run, but more simply, how many offspring you leave behind. And I think this is quite beautifully illustrated here by peacocks, where the magnificent train of the male peacock doesn't necessarily help the male to survive. In fact, probably quite the opposite. It makes it more of a target to predators. Instead, the train simply makes the males more attractive to females and they're able to sire more offspring as a result. And to illustrate this point further, remarkably, I'm fitter now at the age of 47 than I was when I was 18 years old because now I have one child, whereas when I was 18, I had none. Um, so it really is about uh, your number of offspring. Um, in plants, fitness is usually calculated by the numbers of seeds that a plant makes or produces. And one can actually use this as a measure of the strength of natural selection on different floral traits. For example, we tried to measure the strength of natural selection on floral tubes in these gladiolus longicolus plants. Now these plants have quite variable tube lengths. Some of the populations can have very long tubes. Some of the populations can have tubes which are much shorter. And what we found is that the short tube plants are typically uh, pollinated by uh, moths, uh, hawk moths with, with quite short uh, tongues. And I don't know if you can see the tongue on that, um, on that picture, but it's uh, about the length of the hawk moth's body. Um, the longer tube populations tend to be visited by moths with much longer tongues. And you can see this enormous tongue stretching all the way across my hand here. Um, so what we did here is we looked at a population of long tube plants. And you can see that for each flower, what we did is we tried to measure the corolla tube length. So that's on the horizontal axis over there. And then after we measured the corolla tube length of each flower, we later came back to those flowers and we counted the seeds produced by each of those flowers. So the numbers of seeds set by each flower is on that vertical axis over there. So what you can see in this graph is that um, uh, plants with long tubes uh, tend to set many more seeds than plants with much shorter tubes. And that's presumably because of their reproductive structures, which fit better with their long-tongued moth pollinators. And so we would expect that in a population like this, there'd be selection for longer tubes. And we might call this female fitness, the numbers of seeds produced by the female parts of the plant. And the steeper that slope, the stronger that natural selection is on tube length. 
you can imagine if there was a flat slope, uh, a, a flat line, um, it would mean that all plants set the same seeds irrespective of tube length. And so there's actually no selection on tube length. But here you can see a very, very steep slope suggesting strong selection for long tubes. But we've talked about female fitness, but most plants are actually hermaphroditic, right? So they have both male and female sex organs. So here you can see the female sex organ, the, um, the stigma, uh, which uh, collects pollen. But here you can see the male parts, the anthers, and those produce pollen. Um, so by counting seeds, we only really document half the story of floral fitness because uh, this flower over here is able to fertilize seeds on other plants as well as produce their own seeds. So to calculate male fitness, we need to know something about how many ovules a plant sires elsewhere on other plants in the, other popula in the population. And it's a lot harder to do than counting seeds. Um, now, very little is known about aspects of male fitness and how the male aspect of fitness selects on floral traits. And so it is that I've become really interested in what I call pollen journeys, um, the journeys undertaken by pollen grains, because success or failure in these pollen journeys is ultimately what determines male fitness. So very simply put, the pollen journey uh, would start in the anther of a particular flower, say, um, I wonder if I've got a cursor. So this flower over here is producing some pollen. And what happens is the, a pollinator arrives and probably some of that pollen gets placed on that pollinator. The pollinator then um, moves to another flower and that pollen uh, maybe gets placed on the stigma of the flower. So that's the pollen journey, uh, very simply put. But what we've realized is that these pollen, pollen journeys are extremely complex and arduous. In, in fact, only about 2% of the pollen grains ever produced, ever managed to make it to the stigmas of another flower. And it turns out that these pollen journeys are filled with obstacles. Some of the pollen never even gets to start the journey. Other grains manage to get onto pollinators, but they never manage to get onto the stigmas of flowers. And the lucky few that make it to the stigmas of other flowers, well, many of them never actually get to fertilize an ovule. So it turns out that the various potential fates that await pollen, pollen grains along their journey are numerous, extremely numerous, and horrific to contemplate if you're a pollen grain. Um, but each each of these potential obstacles represents a wonderful opportunity for natural selection to act on floral and pollen traits to improve the probability of overcoming those obstacles. So you can imagine when we look at a pollinator, you will see that it could be carrying thousands of pollen grains. And those pollen grains, if they're all from the same species of flower, would probably look more or less identical. So to study these pollen journeys, what we needed to do was figure out a way to mark pollen grains so that we could distinguish the grains of one flower from the grains of another flower. Um, and we figured out that we could attach what we call quantum dots to pollen grains. Now these are nanocrystals which can fluoresce in different colors uh, when you shine an ultraviolet light on them. So by applying different color quantum dots uh, to the pollen of different flowers, we could then tell the pollen from one flower from the pollen of another flower because they're fluorescing in different colors. So this is just a picture of these quantum dots in solution. And you can see the, the different colors that you can get them to fluoresce in. Now, I've been particularly interested in what happens to pollen grains once they're picked up by pollinators. And this represents just one small leg in this journey undertaken by pollen grains. But I'm gonna focus on it because almost nothing is known about what happens to pollen grains once they're attached to pollinators. And to illustrate some of the shenanigans 
that take place there. I'd like to introduce you to these wonderful Morea lurida flowers. So these flowers attract fly, uh, uh, fly pollinators, which lap uh, sugar crystals from the tepals of the, of the flowers. Um, but to get to those crystals, they have to squeeze through uh, the space here indicated by the red arrow. And they've got to squeeze through that space. Um, and when they do so, the flowers smear copious amounts of pollen onto the thorax and the heads of, of the pollinators. So using these quantum dots, we found evidence to suggest that when pollen is laid down on these flies, it can be put down in layers. So in this photograph here, you can see the yellow quantum dot uh, labeled pollen um, of the last Morea flower that this poor fly saw, lying on top of all the pollen from previously visited flowers, which is orange. Um, so you can see this kind of layering effect of pollen grains. Now, I'd just like to expand on this idea a little bit more. Imagine a pollinator which has visited all these four flowers here in sequence, okay? Um, and I've made these colors different, or made these flowers different colors just to show you that uh, I'm maybe labeling each flower with a different colored uh, quantum dot, right? Um, so here we have this pollinator, it visits all four flowers. Um, and if we look at the pollen load on this pollinator's back um, in more detail, it might look something like this, a kind of layer cake with the pollen from the first flower visited, the blue one at the bottom, and the pollen from the last flower visited, the red one at the top. Um, and we found some interesting effects of this layering. For example, um, we found that uh, pollen from the last flowers visited can effectively smother the pollen from previously visited flowers. Um, because it's lying on top of them, um, it can stop the underlying layers from reaching the stigmas of, of flowers. So that might give the last flower visited some kind of siring advantage in these pollen walls. But in other cases, and it's uh, flower dependent, species dependent, in other cases we found that uh, the pollen from the first flower visited can preclude new pollen from attaching to pollen pollinators. So uh, with each subsequent flower, uh, visited, fewer and fewer pollen grains may be deposited. So that suggests that pollinators can also become saturated with pollen, and that once they're saturated, it's hard to get your own pollen onto those pollinators. And if this happens, then the first flowers visited might have a siring advantage because they're able to put more pollen onto the pollinator. So there are these really interesting effects, and we don't know much about it, um, but it's very likely that under different ecological conditions or in different systems, you might find a first male advantage or you might find a, a last male advantage. Um, so you can imagine the situation where the bodies of pollinators become a little bit like those Roman arenas where pollen grains from rival flowers arrive and they compete with one another for access on a little spot on that pollinator's back. And they're able to compete for either by precluding each other from getting there or by smothering the existing pollen grains. And it really got me thinking about other ways that plants could potentially fight for space on these pollinators. And I thought that perhaps flowers could have structures on them which clean existing pollen grains from pollinators before they place their own pollen. And in some cases, oops, in some cases, the female parts of the flowers, the stigmas could do just that. But in humble lobelia flowers, we think that we found some specialized structures which uh, do this job and are evolved specifically for that task. So, here you can see a humble lobelia flower, and they're interesting flowers because they produce pollen inside 
a strange tube-like applicator. And you can see that on the left uh, top of the screen there. Um, so the pollen is produced inside this tube. And um, my son's busy playing the ukulele. I hope you, I hope you can't hear it. Um, hang on yeah, one okay. second. Now, go and practice in your room. OK, thanks. OK. <laughs> 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 you might be lucky and hear the Hall of Fame. Um, yeah, totally. Okay. So, um, so these flowers produce their pollen in these tubes, and they the pollen, when the pollinators visit, the pollen is extruded from a tiny little hole at the end of this tube. Um, later, when the flower's finished being a male, the stigma actually grows all the way through that tube and out and uh, the flower effectively changes from being a male to a female. But what I want you to notice in that uh, top left area there is on the end of that black applicator, there are these tiny little white hairs, um, which, are, which are like the bristles of a toothbrush, and they surround the hole through which the pollen emerges. So in this video that I'm going to show you, I'm hoping that you might be able to see how these bristles brush the pollen off visiting bees before their own pollen is smeared along a groove between the eyes um, of the bee pollinators. So here's the video. Um, what you can see here is a honeybee visiting these flowers. Um, Um, ten. Yeah. Ten so you token. can, yeah. So you, you can, no, 10 minutes, okay. one token. Okay. So you can see, so you can see the, um, the applicator moving up the bee's head here. You can see the white bristles and you can see the pollen being swept in front of them. And if you're lucky in the next video, you can see even some of those pollen grains being flicked off into the air. Um, so here you can see that. So it really is acting like a, a brush, sweeping this pollen. And as the bee retracts its head, the, the plant then uh, 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 deposits its pollen. So you, this might uh, conjure up sort of images and remembrances of strange animals with bizarre structures on their penises used to extract sperm uh, from pre of previous males from the reproductive tracts of females. And here are some of those crazy structures on the ends of dragonfly and damselfly penises. Um, but what I've described to you is perhaps some of the very first evidence to suggest that plants can have similar structures. They're essentially doing the same thing. They're cleaning pollen from pollinators before they're placing their own. Um, and these structures can be used in these pollen wars. Uh, it's like the evolution of a weapon of mass destruction for pollen kind, which allows rival pollen grains to be erased from the face of the bee. So I'm sure that most of the people in this audience are obsessed with flowers in some way or another, be it uh, their beauty or their, their diversity of form. And some of you may even look at flowers and when you do so, you may imagine how each of the uh, floral traits may be adapted to a particular pollinator. But what I hope is that today you've gained a deeper insight into uh, the nitty gritty building blocks of floral adaptation and how each trait can influence female fitness or seed production and how each trait can also give you potentially the edge in these pollen wars essentially male fitness. Um, and with that, I'd like to uh, hand back over to Rupert. Thanks, Bruce. Um, yeah, that exactly shows the, um, the, the war, as you say, and, and it's, it's this uh, arms race between the, the flowers and, and the insects. And the message that we always try and get over in this conservation space is that, we don't know <laughs> what what um, 
is happening. And as a result, we need to be quite um, conservative in terms of allowing special um, populations or interesting ones to, to be destroyed, essentially, because they, there's still learning to be done. And you've illustrated it very elegantly. So thanks so much. And we're going on to your protege now. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So um, uh, Ethan Newman, Dr. Ethan Newman is from a little town of Newton, just outside of Wellington. Uh, and he is a lecturer at um, Rhodes University in, um, uh, in the botany department and looking at plants and their evolutionary adaptations. He's uh, also a BOTSOC member. And um, we, I, I, I've known him since he was at uh, well, high school at Ethan, because <laughs> um, <laughs> there are these uh, uh, young plant people knocking around the Boland. Um, and so he's been interested in plants for a very long time, and now he's teaching young people himself. So thanks for joining us all the way from Makanda. And uh, go ahead and show us uh, what's happening in Titonia and everything else. All right. Sharing my screen quickly. So first of all, Rupert, I just want to say thanks so much um, for inviting me to come speak a little bit about, about more recent research I've been doing. Um, so this is some of the work that I've started at Rhodes. Um, so I've started as a lecturer there, as Rupert mentioned, about two years ago. And when I arrived at Rhodes, so these tritonias were growing absolutely everywhere. And one of the things I noticed from these tritonias, and um, Bruce was speaking quite a lot about pollen, is that these structures or these calluses you find on these tritonias actually very much looks like anthers. And this actually raised the question to me, will these structures are in fact anthem mimics? And so if you can consider that nectar can act as a reward, obviously we do know that pollen is also a reward, then if you have structures on the flower that resembles actual anthers, they can potentially have the same function in attracting pollinators and then potentially deceiving them, thinking that they can get a pollen reward, when in fact, ends up being a dummy. A pollination occurs in any case, and the plant has basically achieved its purpose. So this is what I'm going to be telling you more about, about anthem mimicry in a specific tritonia called Tritonia laxifolia. So when we think about mimicry in plants, um, one of the things that comes up is that you always have um, either you have this, these systems where there's sexual deception occurring, where you have an orchid that has the shape of a female wasp, um, it has the odor that resembles that of the female wasp, and the male wasp try and mates with the flowers. In South Africa, um, we don't have a lot of those examples, but we do have a lot of examples of food deception. And so um, specifically in Dyser, there are a lot of species that resembles nectar rewarding species. And um, they, they do that mostly in terms of color. Um, but as you know, the, the actual orchid itself, this Dyser can see here, this doesn't provide any reward for the pollinator. So by resembling a rewarding flower that contains nectar, it actually then deceives these insects. In this case, the Table Mountain Pride butterfly investing flowers and achieving pollination. Now, with regards to Tritonia, so many bulb enthusiasts will know that there are quite a number of species um, across South Africa that has these um, three-dimensional, what I would call um, anthemomics. So this is Tritonia karuica, and you can see that they are slightly raised within this species, but they become, become more pronounced in others. Um, this is Tritonia uh, sicarigara, that you find in the Klenkaro, and you can see that um, from these callus like structures, um, something that I didn't include in the presentation that I wish I did was actually the coloration um, in terms of how bees perceive actual yellow pollen. So, as you know, bees can also perceive UV, okay, or they are sensitive to UV. And pollen basically appears to bees as being UV absorbent, and they often have this yellow coloration. So given that you have this three-dimensional structure and then um, in terms of resembling, um, in terms of color, the actual pollen of other angiosperms, you can see that the pollen of 
these flowers are in fact this dark purple color. Um, and what we've actually found is that when you contrast that with the background, the bees actually struggle to perceive these purple um, anthers against actual dorsal petals of the flower, making this structures much more pronounced. Okay, so with regards to this idea of anther mimicry within Tritonia, we basically came up with a few questions. Um, and um, these questions basically revolve around preferences of pollinators. So do the pollinators actually prefer the color, including the structure of that three-dimensional anther mimic? And so basically what we did was we manipulated the color of these anther mimics and offered the bees choices. And we painted some of the anther, anther mimics with yellow UV absorbent paint. And we made sure that the color of the yellow UV absorbent paint was the same color um, as the actual um, anther mimics of unmanipulated flowers. And then always also tried to mask the, um, the actual UV absorbent color of that um, anther mimics by painting them with UV reflecting orange paint, similar to the color of um, the actual tepals of the flower. And on the right hand side, you can see this is um, predictions that we made for each potential question and how we potentially thought that this would play out if you would give these bees binary preferences between these two colors. So just below this, this is um, basically um, an experimental setup where you can see that we've left the anther mimics in some flowers intact and the other anther mimics we, or on the other flower, we actually remove the anther mimics. So we were also interested to see whether the bees were specifically interested um, in visiting flowers with those three-dimensional anther mimics, but also then leaving a little bit of the yellow UV absorbent signal behind on the flowers to see whether the bees actually prefer the structure versus the color. So secondly, um, as you can see, these um, what I call anther mimics basically narrows the position between those anther mimics and then the stigma, meaning that if a bee has to crawl over the flower in order to, opt to, to get to the nectar, they have to pass um, or clamber over those anther mimics in order to get there. And so in, that will basically um, cause more pollen to be transferred um, onto the stigmas of the flowers versus if you remove it. And so we were also then interested to see that if this is the case, if those three-dimensional anther mimics do improve pollen transfer um, onto the stigmas, is this also associated by pollen collecting behavior of the bees on those anther mimics? And I think you would agree with me that if the bees actually do demonstrate um, pollen collecting behavior on those anther mimics, I think it's um, a, a pretty good way of, of showing that the bees are convinced that these are, are real anthers that contain pollen. And um, you know, that, this, that this mechanical fit between the flower and the pollinator is facilitated by actual pollen collecting behavior. And then of course, Bruce has explained to you about selection and how female fitness, okay? is one of the, um, it's actually one of the easiest ways uh, to measure selection. And so we wanted to see whether there's a selective advantage of having these three-dimensional uh, structures on the flowers um, and whether this actually improves fitness within flowers that basically um, has these three-dimensional structures. So flowers that we've left this intact, versus flowers that we've actually removed the, the three-dimensional um, anther mimics. And again, you can see that on the panel um, here on the right-hand side, this is basically what we expect to find. Okay, so as I'm gonna move through each of the experiments that we did, I'm also gonna sh just show the, the panel with the expected results um, each time. So for any pollination study, you need to ask yourself um, which visitors, um, or actually um, which pollinators are visiting the flowers. And in this case, of course, which of the visitors are potentially being deceived. And um, at the three localities that we, um, that we worked at, we mostly observed um, the solitary bee, um, Amagila, as well as white butterflies. You know, we conducted single visit experiments um, where we looked at the amount of pollen deposited by bees versus butterflies on the flowers. And before we actually offer this to the, to the pollinators, we remove the anthers from the flowers. And when those stigmas became receptive, we then only offered it 
to the pollinator, meaning that the stigmas um, have never been exposed to a pollinator before. And when we look at pollen deposition on the flowers, it will actually tell us um, whether um, the pollinator is, is actually effective or not. What we found is that these bees transfer a lot more pollen grains per single visit compared to the butterflies. And you can actually see that these butterflies, they're actually thieving from the flowers and these anthemimics, um, in fact, they act like a cage, preventing the butterfly from further inserting its proboscis to access the nectar. Now, um, in, in some way, um, it makes sense that um, these tritonias are primarily visited by these solitary bees. Because if you watch these solitary bees, and you often see them um, in your gardens as well, it's a, it's a very common species, um, especially in the eastern part of the country. They do a lot of pollen collecting. Okay? So on my stoop, um, where I am in Grahamstown, we've got these, um, yeah, I grow plants and I, and I grow them in pots, and a lot of them are filled with, with clay and stapelias in there. And what I've often seen is that these solitary, these um, and Magilla bees, they make these um, nests within the pots, and they when you basically knock those pots over, um, there are a lot of chambers that they basically create, and a lot of them are packed with, um, with pollen and obviously um, larvae. So a lot of the sort of life history of these, of these bees are involved in actually collecting pollen to feed their brood. So um, with regards to the first question, um, this is Catherine Curry. She's an honor student um, in the botany department, and you can see her busy painting um, some of the flowers with the UV um, reflectant orange paint. And so this is basically what it looks like to us. And you might actually think that it's, it's a little bit off, but if you plot this in bee color perception, um, they're actually plotted virtually on top of each other. And the bees cannot basically perceive the actual difference between that um, the paint that we applied and then also um, the orange tipple of the flowers. Now, um, the flower on the right, you can see we actually haven't painted that. What I've left it as is to show you that when you take an image of these flowers um, using a, a, um, a filter that basically blocks out all other light except um, UV, you can see that the um, one trait of these anthemomics is that it has UV absorbent properties. Now, if you had to take an image of, say, an uh, anther with yellow pollen, you will find exactly the same image. So what we've done with um, this UV reflecting orange paint is that we've basically um, we've removed that signal. And then this will really tell us if those bees are really going for the UV absorbent yellow and um, um, anthemomics or whether they are actually just visiting the flowers for nectar. Right, so that's uh, the obvious alternative um, to the situation. This is the results from the preference experiments and it's pretty self-explanatory. So um, on the bottom line or on your X axis, you can actually see that um, here we have our treatment where we've applied the UV absorbent yellow paint. On the right, we have our UV reflecting orange paint. And then you can see um, on the Y axis, the proportion preferences that bees made to the flowers in the choices. And the bees almost always went for the flowers of the UV absorbent um, yellow paint. And you may ask yourself, okay, but you know, it's likely that that could be the result of type of paint that we used that attracted the bees. But we, when we basically compared um, the painted flowers with the, UV, with the UV yellow absorbent paint applied to that, and we um, basically gave the bees a choice in flowers um, that was unmanipulated, okay, so unpainted, um, versus flowers with the UV absorbent yellow paint, they didn't show any preference. And that basically shows that paint didn't have an effect on the preference of bees, but it was in fact the color um, that that did in this scenario. So with regards to the second component um, of the question that we had is, okay, so do anthemomics improve pollen deposition? Is pollen deposition the result of pollen collecting behavior? So um, this is Sandy van Niekerk, and she is a teacher at Victoria Girls High, and she helped me basically removing um, the actual anthemomics from half of um, the experimental plants, which you can see this is actually under ESCOM conditions here. And um, we were basically working under our cell phones and in the dark. And um, what we did is by removing um, the one-off of flowers with the anthemomics um, intact, okay, you can also see we removed the actual anthers of the flower um, versus um, 
goes with um, the anthemomics excised, um, we could basically do two experiments. So we could offer them to pollinators to see if they prefer that three-dimensional structure, but at the same time, um, by removing the actual um, anthers on the flowers and allowing the stigmas to mature, on that preference that that pollinator makes when it visits one of those flowers, we could then actually also determine the amount of pollen deposited per single visit. And so basically, I'm doing two things at once in um, this particular experiment. So with regards to preferences, um, initially I was quite surprised that these bees actually didn't prefer the flowers with the anthemomics intact. And so um, in terms of the preference, this was more or less equal um, between flowers with the anthemomics excised versus um, what I referred to here as the controls that have the anthemomics unmanipulated. And this is likely the result of this UV absorbance signal still being present in the flowers, even if you remove those anthemomics. Um, with regards to how much pollen grains was deposited per single visit, you can see that on your x-axis over here, we have our unmanipulated control again, and then flowers with the anthemomics excised. And then we also then have on the y-axis, number of pollen grains deposited per single visit. And although these error bars may seem like they overlap quite a bit. Um, this is actually just zoomed in. So if you zoom out a little bit, this inset over here, you can see that per single visit, okay? So um, I must also make it clear that when these bees visited a flower, um, we removed the flower from the preference experiment, we cut off the stigma and then placed it under a microscope sign. So a bee was allowed to visit a flower only once, okay? So that's what we refer to here as a single visit. So you can see that per single visit, bees transferred much more pollen on flowers of um, which had the anthemomics intact versus those that were removed. So um, each one of these dots represents a different individual bee transferring pollen. So this would basically indicate a bee um, individual that transferred close to 200 pollen grains. So each one of these represents a bee transferring um, a certain amount of pollen grains. You can see when bees visit the flowers with the anthemomics excised, there's less than 50 um, pollen grains deposited per single visit. Okay. So um, to see whether this pollen deposition um, on these flowers with anthemomics intact versus removed, to see whether this is associated with pollen collecting behavior, I then um, soon after went and filmed interactions of bees with these anthemomics see whether there was any pollen collecting behavior associated with that interaction with the anthers. So in this first clip, I'm just going to try and play it a little bit slow for you guys to see. Um, what you'll notice is that when this bee basically lands on that anthemomic, just watch how it tries to pull on the anthemomic, um, similar to what it would do um, if it was trying to get pollen from an anthem. So there you can see it's approaching it. Check how it's pulling on that anthemomic. So they basically um, exhibit this pulling behavior, but they also use their front tarsi to try and scrape pollen um, from the anthem. And you can see it in this example over here. So just look at the, the bees' forelegs. You can see that. And often when they um, do this pollen collecting behavior on the flowers, they don't consume any nectar. Um, I think this bee's gonna go for it again. Um, so just watch closely. So there's no nectar foraging happening. It's literally just trying to, trying to get pollen off that anthemomix. And so flower on the left-hand side, you have actually removed the anthemomix. And what we've found is that bees, they forage for nectar more often on flowers with the anthemomix removed versus when they are intact. Okay, you could actually have seen the extension of the proboscis of the bee as it left the flower. Here you can see it again. So I'm just trying to get out of the video quick. Ah, there you go. So with regards to the behaviors um, exhibited by these bees on flowers with the anthemomics excised versus the controls, um, as you can see, um, in terms of actual nectar consumption, this happened more often on flowers with the anthemomics removed versus those intact. And then, um, the rest of the bars, these represent pollen collecting behaviors. And you can see that there's more pulling behavior 
on the flowers with the um, anthemomics intact and also more scraping behavior versus those where the anthemomics have been removed. Okay. So with regards to the last uh, question we had, so what are the effects of the the type, including the interaction with anthemomics on seed production? So we basically did exactly the same experiments um, on rooted plants in the field as we did when we conducted the preferences and the single visits to look at pollen deposition. So um, the idea there was um, that if um, the pollinators would transfer more pollen at a single visit per se on flowers with the anthem intact, it should also relate to more seed set, um, indicating that these three-dimensional structures actually have selective advantage for the, the plant. In the end. And so what we did was initially, um, we thought that butterflies could potentially be important pollinators, um, but the single visit basically showed that they are not put, um, important pollinators. And also this next set of results um, kind of um, explains this um, quite well. So what we did was we had these um, treatments where we've cut off the anthemomics, others that we left intact, and we've placed cages over half of those treatments, the other half we left open, and we then basically looked at the seed set. Here you can see this is how we label them for T being treated and U being untreated. So you can see that the um, fruit capsules of, of, of those that we left untreated, mice and fat, and had a lot of seeds in them versus those that were treated, okay? And see that there's much less seeds in there. So if we have a look at um, the set of results over here, you can see that um, in terms of the amount of seed set, okay, from flowers that were um, that had the anthemomics intact, you can see that it produced much more seeds compared to those with the anthemomics excised. And it really didn't matter whether the flowers um, were out in the open or whether they were caged. So that basically gave exactly the same set of results, showing that there's a selective advantage of having that three-dimensional structures in the flowers. And so very interesting. Um, you know, at the end of the day, most of our predictions were um, supported. And so we actually did find that the bees preferred the yellow UV absorbent um, signal from the anthemomics. Um, in terms of the actual structure, that was the only one that, that wasn't supported. And again, um, as I've mentioned previously, I think or I suspect it's because of this UV, uh, yellow UV absorbent signal being enough to actually attract the pollinator. And then um, in panel C, we did find more pollen grains deposited per single visit on the flowers with the anthemomics uh, remaining intact versus those that are removed. And this also translated in seed set. So the rest of the results, I'll let you guys interpret on your own. Uh, thanks so much for listening. So um, I just have one more slide. And these are the co-authors um, involved in the project. And so this is Catherine Curry. So she was involved um, in a lot of the statistical analysis, especially for um, a component looking at the color perception. And then Sandy van Niekerk was also um, very important in terms of um, starting, uh, helping me start the project and especially sitting late nights, uh, cutting up <laughs> a lot of flowers for, for preferences and single visits. And then of course, uh, Professor Craig Peter is our HOD at Botany. And um, Craig Peter, um, he has so much enthusiasm uh, for natural history. And the two of us, um, you know, we had so much fun uh, designing um, this paper. And actually, it was accepted recently for publication in Evolution. And so hopefully within the next two weeks, um, you guys should get it online. So if you're interested in reading further on, the, on this work, um, you can just pop me an email and I'll send that paper to you um, when it's ready. Thanks so much, Rupert, for giving me this opportunity to speak. Yes, thanks, Ethan. Um, and uh, like, it's always interesting to see the the intricate work that uh, is part of this. It's not just going out and looking at lomikis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also, we we just wanted to thank Ethan to, for rising from his sick bed to join us. He's not been well. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Okay. Cool. Thank you. So just stop sharing there. And uh, oh, yeah, Jessica, if you could. Okay, um, I'll do that now. Thank you. If you could thank put you. on your camera. And unmute. <laughs> Hi. So um, Jessica is joining us from Johannesburg. She's uh, currently busy with a PhD 
at the University of Witwatersrand, um, looking at the systematics and pollination ecology of Galtonia. Uh, she's a plant enthusiast, and um, she's going to be telling us about her master's work on Alloraceae. And uh, just from a, a botanical society point of view, she's also got an article coming out in the June issue of Felt and Flora, which should be with you shortly. So for more detail, check out um, the article, but yeah, you get to hear it directly from the source. So thanks, Jessica, for making time. And uh, we looking forward to hear what you say about this near threatened aloe. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Um, yeah, thank you, Bruce, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm excited to present part of my master's research, which is based on birds and bees and their role in the pollination of the summer flowering Alloraceae, variation Raceae. So Alloraceae is a summer flowering aloe endemic to South Africa and is mainly distributed in Mpumalanga. Similar to most South African aloes, Alloraceae has floral traits consistent with um, bird pollination um, as seen by their red-orange tubular periods, its copious nectar production, and its strongly exerted stamens and styles. And in previous studies during the 2014 and 2017 flowering season by Craig Symes and Stephanie Payne respectively, both birds and bees were observed as frequent visitors of this aloe species. However, their role in the pollination had not been formally investigated. Additionally, um, short billed generalist species such as cape weavers, as well as your long billed um, specialists like your sunbirds, were also observed as frequent visitors. But each study um, had different visitation rates and yielded contrasting nectar properties. So it was unclear whether Alloraceae had a generalist or a specialist bird pollination syndrome. So we investigated the role of birds and insects, particularly bees, in the reproductive biology of Alloraceae and the relative importance of generalist and specialist birds in its pollination. To determine the role of birds and bees in the pollination of Alloraceae, we conducted observations of floral visitors. We also measured the pollen loads of both um, insect and bird visitors. And we also conducted pollinator exclusion experiments to determine the contribution of bees to the reproductive output in Alloraceae. And what we found is that Alloraceae is visited by a broad range of insects, um, but African honeybees contributed majority of insect visits and they were observed um, removing pollen and drinking nectar. And solitary bees such as Eulacea glossum species were also frequently observed and drinking nectar. Alloraceae is also visited by a variety of birds um, like cape weavers, malachite sunbirds, we had amethysts and a variety of other generalists. However, only cape weavers, malachite sunbirds, amethysts and greater double collared sunbirds were observed feeding on Alloraceae nectar. And of these birds, cape weavers contributed a majority of all bird visits and it was approximately 58% of all bird visits, while Malachite sunbirds was the most common specialist bird visitor and contributed around 33% of bird visits. And these findings were consistent with science findings during the 2014 flowering season. However, even in the 2017 flowering season, Cape weavers still contributed 41% of the overall bird visits, which indicates that these birds have been consistently abundant at this population, while the abundance of the Malachite sandbirds has fluctuated in the multiple flowering periods. If we look at the pollen load of bees and birds, we can see that the pollen load 
um, did not differ significantly between the birds and the bees, which indicates that both of these pollinator guilds do play a role in the pollination of Alaritiae. And high pollen loads were present on both cape weavers and malachite sunbirds, which coupled with their abundance and frequent visitation indicate that both these birds are pollinators of Alaritiae. However, even though these high pollen nodes were observed on bees, the pollinator exclusion experiment showed that birds did not greatly contribute to the reproductive output of Alaritia. And you can see that in the bird exclusion treatments. So these were treatments which only allowed insect visitors. It produced significantly lower seed set compared to open treatments, which um, allowed all visitors um, to visit um, the racemes. We then looked at the relative importance of generalist and specialist bird pollination in Alaritiae. And to do so, we measured the nectar properties to determine whether Alaritiae has a generalist or specialist bird pollination syndrome. And then we also measured the visitation rates, pollen load, and main pollen deposition sites of um, malachite sunbirds and cape weavers. We also compared the bull morphology to the floral morphology, and this was to see if these bird pollinators could have contacted the reproductive organs of the flowers visited. And we compared their bull length to floral tube length, as well as to stamen and style length to see if they would come into contact. And we also measured um, the bull curvature to see um, how efficiently they could feed with the curvature of the um, aloe tubes. And what we found is that pollen is mainly deposited on the throats of cape weavers and malachite sunbirds. And this is their main pollen deposition site. And this is quite common in aloes with strongly exerted filament. And the pollen was also deposited on the crowns of both bird species. And you can clearly see the orange pollen, which is showed by the black um, arrows on the cape weavers and the malachite sunbirds, as well as on the um, crown and their bills. When we looked at the nectar properties, Alaritii produces large volumes of relatively dilute nectar, which indicates that Alaritii has generalist nectar properties which combined with its long narrow floral tubes, as well as its strongly exerted stamens and styles, indicate that Alaritii has floral trait intermediate between a specialist and a generalist bird pollination system. And it is because of these intermediate floral traits that enables effective pollination by both cape weavers and malachite sunbirds. If we compare their morphology and their feeding behavior, both these bird species do feed on the aloe nectar quite differently, which you'll see. So you can see that cape weavers fully insert their heads into the floral tubes to reach the nectar at the base of the flower. And they also feed upside down by perching on the closed racemes um, and then feeding from the bottom up. And in doing so, they fully insert their heads, which enables um, them to come into contact with the strongly exerted filaments, which then wrap pollen onto these key facial regions. And then they can um, effectively um, transfer pollen as they move from plant to plant. In comparison, malachite sunbirds um, perch on the base of the peduncle and feed upwards, extending their bills into the floral tubes. And this feeding behavior is um, made much easier as their decurve bills match the curvature of the floral tubes, which enables the filaments and the stamen and styles to come into contact with their key facial regions, which enables effective cross-pollen transfer as they move from plant to plant. So in conclusion, we can see that Alaritia is predominantly bird pollinated, which is consistent with its um, floral traits. And although honeybees were highly abundant, 
the bird exclusion experiments did show that they only play a minor role in the pollination. And the generalist nectar properties combined with the, um, the long stamens and long floral tubes show that the intermediate floral traits enables effective pollination by both generalist and specialist bird species. And although cape weavers and malachite sunbirds are both effective pollinators, due to their consistent abundance and more frequent visitation, we can conclude that cape weavers are the primary pollinators of Alorhytiae. And why um, identifying primary pollinators are important, especially in aloes, is because majority of aloes are reliant on pollinators for reproduction, which comes into how we can assist um, as people for um, helping our pollinators. So because majority of South African aloes flower in winter, they provide a vital food source for birds and insects during the dry winter months when other food sources are scarce. And currently wild aloe populations are under threat due to habitat loss and illegal harvesting of wild aloe population for collection or for horticulture. And we as citizen scientists can also assist with preventing this by reporting illegal harvesting of wild aloes. And we can also locate restricted or endangered aloes by doing iNaturalist observations. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much, Jessica. Um, and, you know, this is always the interesting thing about pollination is we, we think that with the big showy flowers like aloes, we've got it all figured out. <laughs> and how many species of aloes are there that we still haven't really figured out? I think about the little grass aloes that you have up in, in the grasslands where there's a massive range of, of flower colors and sizes. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to share one slide quickly and um, to the audience, start sticking your questions into, into the chat. Um, what I want to do just to continue the theme on is uh, what does this have to do with pollination? So here we have the, um, we have the uh, spatial development framework for Mossel Bay and it's, you can't see any pretty flowers. But this is the kind of documentation that we need to pay attention to as BOTSOC members and people who love nature, because these inputs uh, are where the decisions get made in terms of where local government budget goes to. And through the training that, that we're, we're looking at, and obviously the information we keep on sharing on our, our platforms and on, the, on um, these webinars, we really um, are wanting uh, this, pop, uh, this community to go out and keep your eyes open for when these documents come out so that we can give the plants, especially um, a, a bit of a voice. So just keep your eyes up on these. And then uh, while I've got the floor, um, we might have just concluded the City Nature Challenge, but Tomorrow, we've got a planning meeting for the Great Southern Bio Blitz, which happens at the end of October. So um, we've got a, a couple of months to get up and running and bring in more people and, and get more skilled so that we can have fun uh, in nature in, uh, all together in um, a few months' time. And then finally, from a, a, a BOTSOC point of view, um, We've got our AGM coming up. So the counter is, this is obviously a still from our website, but on the 2nd of July is the Botanical Society AGM. Keep an eye on our social medias and your mailbox to see uh, where it's going to be. But um, next week, the resolutions will be opening um, and also check these dates, the 17th of June for the closing of uh, submissions. Um, nominations for council, as well as proxy and postal votes. So these are all important things that we need to do to make sure that our society keeps up and running. Um, and it ties in directly to the point about keeping your eye out on the various um, 
public participation processes that we need to go. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing now um, and ask my fellow panelists to put their, their cameras on and let's see if there's any questions um, that have come in. Um, not really. <laughs> so, so um, okay. Uh, there's, there's a great point from Tony Rubello, um, who's said, if you want to contribute pollinator observations on iNaturalist, use the Interactions project, and he's got the link there. So iNaturalist, please use that. Uh, I was wondering if um, the panelists wanted to ask each other anything in terms of uh, what's come up. I think I may have a question for Bruce. Go for it. <laughs> Bruce, I thought your talk was incredible. Uh, that was absolutely amazing. Um, I've often Even thought, without the data. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was especially the, um, the idea of pollen layering. So I've often wondered in many co flowering species, sharing a pollinator in, say, a particular locality, um, you often don't actually see divergence of traits between them. And something that I've always wondered that, you know, if a pollinator is only a certain amount being constant within what in one species and only switches into the next species, do you think that that, that can actually then sort of, um, you know, um, slow down potential divergence? And in that situation, heterospecific pollen transfer is not as strong. So we're gonna have to um, simplify um, that for the audience. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, um, I think just in simple terms, um, you know, in you know, uh, in terms of these pollen wars between species that that, that co-flower different species, um, what you expect is that they can diverge in traits to prevent um, them from interacting with each other on the body of the pollinator. And so something that you often observe um, within populations, um, or sorry, plant communities that share a pollinator is that there's actually no divergence, but they still share that particular pollinator. And I was wondering if this idea of pollen layering um, might, might actually play a role in that. So in order to reduce um, pollen from the wrong species actually landing um, on a stigma. So decreasing it to specific pollen transfer. Do you think that that could lead to less divergence occurring and why we don't see much character displacement? Possibly. Um, I, I think another, another reason might be that, um, you know, if pollinators are constant, in other words, if they visit one flower, one flower, one species of flower over and over again, which often happens, um, mm. And then switches to the other species and visits that species over and over mm. again. Then, then you really won't get a hell of a lot of pollen movement mm. between flowers. And so, yeah, maybe, maybe, you know, they, you don't even have to invoke the idea of layering for that. Um, but I think right. layering might even, as you say, um, mm. facilitate less movement as well. Especially if the pollen placement position is very similar. Yeah. I, I, sorry, cool. I actually had a question for you as well. I was trying to remember mm. what, it, what it was, Ethan. Uh, I wanted to ask you, did you find that there were differences in the numbers of pollen grains deposited by nectar foraging versus pollen foraging bees? Mm. Yeah, you know, if, if I had more time to, to um, disentangle that, I think, I think it would have been very interesting. Um, Something I didn't mention in the talk is that it's not just pollen collecting behavior that actually results in more transfer. Those bees do also consume nectar. Yeah. But what you often do find is that um, when they come um, into um, an array of flowers, they mostly only um, uh, display one kind of behavior. So they try and collect pollen. Um, and then I'll also mention that something that's really interesting is that um, and I think this is for bees that are a little bit more experienced. Some of them actually figure out where the, where the um, anthers are with the pollen and then they kind of go onto the flowers and they scrape a little bit. But I think it's those naive bees right at the beginning. So the newly emerged ones that are really perceived. And so this will be something, you know, going further into the story that would be interesting to, to figure out. 
but it's definitely um, nectar foraging as well as, as, as pollen collecting behavior on those anthemomics that results um, in pollen transfer, um, pollen, obviously pollen pickup and transfer. Sorry, I'm just thinking about a bee academy where you have the naive and less naive bees. Um, yeah. <laughs> Bruce, I wanted to ask a question um, just in terms of, you know, we've got all these intricate um, relationships that we're, we're still busy untangling. Do you guys keep a table of the 20,500 South African species in terms of, you know, these ones have been studied or not? Because I think it would be a good idea to have a Google Doc <laughs> because, you know, it would be a shame if, if labs started overlapping and studying the same thing when there's just so much still to, um, to untangle. You know, there, there is an, I, I don't keep such a document. Ethan, <laughs> Ethan's better than me. I know that he, he's done a bit more of that. But, you know, I find that even when two people are studying the exact same species, we come up with different questions. And I think, in a way, that's the really cool thing. Like, uh, I saw Jessica's study now on aloes, and there have been other studies on aloes and birds versus bees. But you know what? Her story is different to everyone mm. else's. And I, I think that's the really cool thing about it, is that we can study the same thing or very similar things, come up with different questions, different answers, and we just keep on getting deeper and deeper into it. Cool. Then I've got a question for Jessica as well, um, because it's, it's from the chat. Uh, because your supervisor, Sandy, um, who did pollination work on proteas, she, uh, there's a question from Deirdre. Are there other pollinators of proteas other than birds and insects? Um, well, yes. Yeah, so there are rodent-pollinated aloes. So Sandy has published a paper based on that. Um, where you do get, I mean, sorry, proteas, where you do get proteas that are rodent pollinated. Um, also in aloes, there was um, studies by Dr. Stephanie Payne, who also found that even in aloes, you do get rodent pollinated aloes. So it's mm. quite interesting how diverse both of these plants are and that they pollinated by insects, birds, and also mammals. Yeah, because I saw a video of us at the conference once where there were um, small spotted genets and all sorts of things climbing into the proteas. Um, okay, last question, and then I've got one more ad break. Um, Stacy's asking, um, just to follow on what Ethan was saying in terms of how these pollen wars link to plant traits, is there a link between these pollen wars and flowers hedging their beds by emerging at different times in the season? Do you want to go with that, Ethan? Oh, sorry, I think that, that the Bruce question one? for Bruce. Yes, that's okay. Me. But for me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, that actually, that actually talks quite a lot to things that Ethan has been doing. And actually, Ethan brought... When he asked me his question, he was asking something along similar lines. And, you know, his, he was saying that, you know, when you get plants flowering. So, sorry, I, I should just backtrack a little bit. The question mm -hmm. that was just asked now is talking about pollen wars between different species. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was talking about pollen wars within a species. Okay. So, the pollen wars that I was really talking about were pollen wars between individuals of the same species. So it's between male flowers fighting for access to the same females. Okay. And so that's what makes flowers pretty really is that each flower has to evolve traits that get their pollen out there rather than the flower next to them, which is the same species. Um, Ethan asked me a question, and this question is very similar to Ethan's, uh, about pollen wars potentially between different species. So that's also a problem. So you've got pollinators, and you can see them as a resource, really, flying around there. And it's a very limited resource because they're small, and there are only certain parts of a pollinator which are good to place their pollen. If we think about bees, and now I'm digressing a little bit again, but bees are quite interesting. Um, they have certain 
Ethan, Ethan showed you that the bees like to eat pollen, okay? And um, they're very good at grooming pollen off them. And there are only certain places on the bees which they can't reach and groom pollen. It's like us trying to scratch our back. We're not very good at scratching our back, but we can scratch all our other parts. Bees are similar. There's a little line up their back, which is hard for them to reach, and also along their, um, along their sternum. And most of the plants pollinated by them try to put their pollen precisely on those places where it's hard to reach. And if all the plants in the community are doing that, that's a bit problematic because as Ethan suggested, if they're all putting their pollen on the same place, then um, your pollen tends to often get lost to the wrong species of plant. Um, and so one way of reducing that problem is if you're able to uh, evolve slightly different places of pollen placement along the bee's uh, midline. So maybe some plants place their pollen near the head, some on the thorax and some on the abdomen, but all along that midline. Then you can separate your pollen out and you don't lose it to, to the wrong species. And then this question over here is also talking about pollen wars within a community of plants, different species of plants. And they're asking, well, um, does it help if you can um, separate things out in time as well? And it certainly would. So uh, flowers flowering at different times, and you'll often find this. So what's interesting is you'll follow bee pollinators seasonally. And at the beginning of the season, they'll visit one species of plant and later on another species of plant. And at the end of the season, another species of plant. And because the flowering times don't overlap, um, you get less movement between uh, different species. And I think all of these things, morphology as well as the timing of flowering are really important in facilitating the coexistence of lots of different species within our floral communities. It's a little bit like um, radio stations. If everyone used uh, uh, exactly the same frequency to broadcast their, their radio, you'd only be able to have one radio station. But if you uh, separate your radio stations where everyone's broadcasting over different frequencies, you can have coexistence of multiple radio stations. Awesome. I'm just going to do another ad Rick, quickly. So videos and cameras off these hosts. Um, so coming up um, soon is the, on the 28th of May, which is Saturday, is the um, virtual Kirstenbosch uh, plant fair. So that'll be running online for a week. So you've got a week to choose your plants and then another week to go and pick them up. And um, they've got several thousand interesting plants. So just go and check out when the website goes live on the weekend. And um, it's the right time to plant in the Cape now because we've had some nice, cool, wet weather and the bulbs are starting to emerge. And then I just want to say uh, formally thank you to all the speakers, um, to Bruce and to Jessica and Ethan for letting us um, know what's going on inside the, the flowers and why, and just drawing your attention to our next uh, webinar, which is the last Thursday of June, so the 30th, where we'll be talking about some of the Botsock conservation projects that the branches have been up to. So we look forward to you joining us then. Um, so thanks uh, everyone for, for joining us. Um, that concludes the formal part of 